Manchester United have had a tumultuous few years since Sir Alex Ferguson retired. We've had the David Moyes reign seven months there, and we had Louis van Gaal for a couple of years. And now in the third year of Jose Mourinho, Mourinho is under intense pressure. But there has been one constant throughout all of this, and that's Ed Woodward, the man who replaced David Gill as Manchester United's executive vice chairman, as the chief executive overseeing United's operations. Now, lots of United fans dislike Ed Woodward, an ex-banker, for being so in control of footballing decisions at the club. But is he really one of the main causes of United's problems at the moment? Now, to discuss this today, thank you very much. We've got uh, Jonathan Northcroft from the Sunday Times. Uh, he is going to be discussing an article that he wrote on Ed Woodward and the situation and hopefully explaining to you in a bit more detail exactly what's happened in terms of Ed Woodward coming into the club as the accountant for the Glazers and his rise through the club and maybe why He's not the best person to be involved in the footballing decisions. Thank you very much for joining me today, Jonathan. My pleasure. Hi, Sam. Uh, so let's get straight to it, I suppose. For those that don't know, Jonathan, can you summarise Ed Woodward's rise through the ranks at United? As I said, from being the accountant who helped the Glazers take over the club on a leveraged deal to the position he now holds. Yeah, I mean, Ed, Ed um, started working with the Glazers when he was at, at JP Morgan. Um, he, he has an accountancy background, uh, actually did a physics degree then, went into accountancy with Price Waterhouse, um, went to JP Morgan, started working with, with the Glazers then. He was one of the main brains behind their leverage buyout of, of Manchester United, which was an incredibly clever deal from their point of view, as we've seen. So uh, I think that would be an early sign of his, his sort of brilliance as a, as a deal maker, as a money man in the financial world. And really earned their, their trust and, and developed a very close relationship, particularly with Joel Glazer during those times. It's Joel Glazer, I'm sure United fans know that of all the, the Glazer sort of scions is the is the one that's most um, interested in the running of the club. Mm -hmm. So that's where it sort of started. Ed then worked um, really in putting together um, sort of commercial deals for, for United um, in, in sort of building up the, the revenue streams uh, until David Gill um, was ready to step aside. I mean, I, I, I think Ed had had his eye on that job for a while. He wanted to to try and have his turn at running the club. And, and when David Gill was ready to go, the Glazers turned to, I guess, their most trusted man at the club to, to, to go and run things. And Edward has been heavily involved in United since then, hasn't he? If you look at since 2013, United have spent roughly about £600 million on transfers at a time. A lot of players have come in and come out. But how much has Ed Woodward been directly involved in the signings of players like Angel Di Maria, who in your article, as you say, is a, is a world-class dribbler signed for a manager like Louis van Gaal, who doesn't particularly like dribblers? Yeah, I, th I think we've got to think about Ed's policy. So when Ed, when Ed took over uh, in 2013, the model he had for Manchester United really was the Real Madrid model, the Galactico model. Um, Ed's... We know, we know he's brilliant at making deals. We know he's brilliant at making money for Manchester United. I think he'd seen the, the power of star footballers, star names in, in selling sponsorship deals and in, in um, growing the, the, the club's popularity abroad. And that's very much the, the model that he wanted to, to go down. In fairness to Ed, I think we have to also remember at that time back in 2013, football was changing. Um, there wasn't just Chelsea, Manchester City were trying to spend very, very big Real Madrid and Barca were spending ever bigger. So I think there was an acknowledgement that United needed to spend bigger and maybe go to a different category of player anyway. So I think those two things fitted together, that Ed wanted to, to move United's signing policy on to something maybe a bit bolder than it had been before. And that's a backdrop for signings like Di Maria. In, I mean, in his first transfer window when David Moyes was in charge, I think a lot of time was wasted trying to chase Ronaldo, Gareth Bale, Cesc Fabregas. Unrealistic deals, really, that just they couldn't bring to fruition. Um, and we know how that one ended. Um, going forward, um, there was a desperation to start making big signings. And, of course, Di Maria came in the next summer when, when Van Gaal was manager. Now, I am not pretending to have been privy to those conversations, so I don't know exactly how much it was Van Gaal pushing to have a, a, an attacking creative player and how much it was Ed... Um, sort of foisting De Maria on, but but he was certainly very keen to start making signings like that. That was the first sort of world, well, it wasn't a world record, but it was a British record. It was the first sort of mega deal, really, that they'd pulled off. It was a kind of signing that Ed was very, very keen to make. And, of course, it just fitted um, 
or rather it didn't fit at all with, with, with Van Gaal and his, his football style. You know, Van Gaal is suspicious of players who dribble. Van Gaal doesn't like particularly like traditional wing play. So Manchester United go out and sign, you know, the, the, the guy that's at that point in time, 2014, he just won Real Madrid the Champions League. Finally, they go out and sign maybe the, the best sort of dribbling attacking player in the world at that time. And, and I think that was an early sign of how the, the transfer policy just stopped fitting together at United. I mean, another point that you raised there in the article is that you discuss how Ed Woodward wanted to reinvent the wheel on transfers. And, and the way you discuss that is that Ed Woodward wanted to court deals, not with the players themselves, but sort of lean more on the agents. And you look at Manchester United over the last few years and the power that Mina Raiola has got and the amount of money he made out of the Paul Pogba deal, the amount of money that Alexis Sanchez's agent made out of his move from Arsenal. Is this part of the problem now at United, that everything seems to be about throwing money, as much money as possible at players and agents to help push the transfers through? Is, is, is that played into the issue that United have? Yeah, I, I think the biggest, I think if you're looking at the big picture, the issue has been that the stra- there hasn't been a strategy. The strategy has really been um, based around stars, whether that's a star manager or a star player, but it's been a feeling that we're Manchester United. You know, we are, if not the biggest, one of the biggest clubs in, financially in the world. And we can use our financial muscle to get back to the top of football. Now, I think that was possible in football 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I think things have moved on. I think other clubs are just so much cleverer and more joined up with their thinking. And they're unearthing stars, talents a lot earlier in the process. Um, and the, the paying of the agents, the, 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 the courting of, of, of players via that route. I mean, again, I think it was a call that Ed made. Um, I can understand why he did it. it, it transfer market is getting more competitive. How do you get an edge? How do you, how do you become the, 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 the club that a, a top player chooses over another club? One thought at the time was you do the deal with the, the player's representatives first. You do it with the player and their representatives. Obviously, you make that about money because that's the way to their hearts. Mm. And, and you, get them on, you get them on board and you do it that way. I think Luke Shaw was actually quite an early success. They brought them. United won the race for Shaw ahead of likes of Chelsea. I think by doing exactly that, by convincing the player, his family, his agent, that that was the right thing to do, paying a little bit of money to, to sort of help smooth the deal. Um, but it's just led United down the, 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 the wrong path, I feel. I, I feel that there was, a, you know, there was that point where Mina Raiola was behind, what, four transfers in a row, three, four trans, big transfers in a row. That always struck you as dangerous because of his history with, with other clubs, because of his modes of behaviour. Um, uh, because of his history with United, you thought that's a that's going to be a difficult relationship to maintain. And I think we're now in the situation, as I said in the article, that this guy's taken about £60 million out of deals involving United. Some of that was paid by Juventus over Pogba, but nonetheless, United have paid a, the lion's share of that. And yet he ends up the enemy of the club, you know, because what is his loyalty to? His loyalty is to his players and probably to his own bank balance rather than to Manchester United. So I think while United have been doing that, I think what has emerged is actually the real way to get top players is to have a plan and a great coach and have an environment players want to come and work in and play for. We've, we've, we've seen top players, because they earn so much that giving them extra wages isn't necessarily going to be the be-all and end-all. I think, I think the, the real top players want to go somewhere that they feel they're going to be happy, they're going to play the football they want, and they're going to be part of something that's on the up. And we've seen Liverpool and Manchester City probably get gain players by being by having attractive environments and coaches to to, to go into and and that's what united uh, haven't been doing i don't think i think they've been waving money at, at players rather than trying to sell them a set of values well i'm not going to disagree with that with the amount of money that we've spent in terms of how poorly united look as a team in comparison to liverpool and city and a, a major talking point you you touched on there in terms of having a top manager with a plan you look at Jose Mourinho, you know exactly what you're getting in Jose Mourinho. He's a man for now, he's a man for winning now, he's not a man for building a team. Like Louis van Gaal, he was, said he was trying to build a team to leave behind. And he, I think he certainly left United in a better position than when he got United. But this summer was the beginning of the major problems with Mourinho and Ed Woodward in that after two years of backing Jose Mourinho, United then decided that Ed Woodward was a better man for making the footballing decisions over the transfers like Toby Alderweireld or players that Mourinho wanted that Ed Woodward disagreed with. You know, how is it, how is it allowed at United that 
a man with no football in background in Ed Woodward is allowed to undermine Jose Mourinho as a football manager in terms of the transfers that he can or can't make at the club? Well, th th this is a confusing thing, Sam, because, you know, Ed, Ed had always said that he believed in the all-powerful manager model rather than directors of football. He said that two or three years ago. Um, and basically what he means is the way United did things under Ferguson worked, so therefore we're going to keep that model. Uh, now, I would suggest that the model that United had then was having a brilliant manager, having maybe the, the best ever in, in Sir Alex Ferguson. That was their model. It wasn't, wasn't the structure. It was just having Fergie. Um, so there was an attempt to replicate that. But OK, if that's what you're going to do, fine, fine. You know, I, I, I think directors of football and so on are the way forward. But OK, if, if that's the route you're going to go down, fine. So why then give Jose Mourinho a new contract and say you believe in the all-powerful manager model and then take away the manager's power by withdrawing backing for, for his targets in the transfer window. Now, I can understand the argument that Ed has been putting forward as to why those targets were being not being backed because the argument is we should be going for younger players because that's United's tradition. Fine, fine, okay, that's the tradition. But you've gone down this different model and, and you've bought Jose Mourinho, as you say, Sam, a man that's, that's, that's been incredibly successful He's a manager for bringing you success now. You've given him a new contract. You need to back him. You need to say, Jose, you know what you need to make this team better. You are a man who's won repeatedly in your career. If this is what you want, this is the route we're going to go down. It's this confused thinking that, that, that I, I, I think has really hurt United, going back to the you know what I mentioned about Van Gaal and, and, and De Maria. And this is another example of it. It's things not joining up at all, and I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, there really does seem to be a disconnect in how the club is run. I think now more than ever, you know, there really is a focus on the poor structure behind the scenes in terms of the Glazers, obviously. You know, United fan wants the Glazers in charge, but that's never going to change, not with United making record revenues. But it's more the structure of the footballing club behind the scene. Because how far behind Man City and Liverpool do you really think United are? There's been reports coming out this week that United are looking at uh, Juve's former CEO, Giuseppe Marotta, and the current sporting director, Fabio Paratici, as an option to restructure. What do you think is needed to, to bridge that gap between where United are right now to where Liverpool and City have put themselves? Well, look, I think, first of all, if those rumours are true, then, then that's, that's good news for Manchester United. I think that's exactly the route they need to be going down, um, which, which, you know, the, if you think about the Manchester City model, that's exactly what they've got in Soriano. And, and Begeristan, and, and, and I think it'd be good news for United if they went down that route. But how far they're behind, I mean, I think that's the thing that should worry United fans a bit. Liverpool started the current um, building process that, 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 that we now see in 2012, when, when Mike Gordon of FSG came to run things. They put Michael Edwards in charge as, as, as football director, then sporting director, and they started building a scouting team, uh, and they started profiling coaches. They went through a couple of teething problems with, with, with Brendan Rodgers and eventually got Klopp. Klopp arrived to a ready-made model. Manchester City started doing it round about the same time. Begeristan and, and Soriano, I think, took over not long after that, maybe maybe 2013 or whatever. So we're talking about United being four or five years behind these major rivals in terms of where they've been building. You think of Chelsea or, 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 or Tottenham, They've got different ways of doing things, unique ways of doing things, but ways of doing things that have actually been quite stable. Abramovich and his team of people have been, have been making the right decisions or making the decisions for, for 10, 15 years. Daniel Levy's been, been at Spurs almost as long. You know, they, they've got ways of doing things. Arsenal have caught up with us at last. Arsenal started about 18 months ago to put an executive team in place. So, and that's before we even talk about Europe and, and what they've got at Barca and Bayern and, and, and the stability there. So I would suggest that United are, 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 are starting to think along the right lines, but there's a lot of catching up to do. And what they're going to need to do is, is get the right people in place. And they probably will need to spend some of that mega money again to, to try and make up a lot of ground in a short space of time. Mm, it is a worrying situation. But, you know, Gary Neville right now in the last week or two has been prevalent in terms of his reactions to everything that's going on at the club right now. And he called the club rotten and asked for changes to be made from the top down. But... Ed Woodward is there, you know, he's a brilliant money man, you know, he's been responsible for helping United and their revenues top over £600 million, but is he fit to be making the footballing decisions at Manchester United? 
and if he if he isn't, you know, where where do United need to turn? Do you need to turn to, as you say, that restructuring? Yeah, look, I have, I have to say, um, I, I don't think this should become personal against Ed Woodward. Um, I think Gary's wrong to say that Manchester United are rotten. I don't think they're rotten. I just think the club has become confused and, and, and misguided. Um, I think Ed is, you know, I've, I've met Ed on a number of occasions. He's, a, he's an intelligent man. His heart is in the right place. He's not on an ego trip. He really does want this to succeed. He's working 24 hours to try and make it succeed. It's just not working for him. He has to recognize that. Hmm. But I don't think he is, you know, I don't think he's rotten. I don't think he is something that has to be removed. I would suggest that he's got enough on his plate in running Manchester United and he, and he, should, he, should, he should maybe go back to doing that and, 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 and take a step back from the football side. I mean, another point would just be that, you know, he's got a, a really high class financially speaking uh, financial sector speaking team of people around him and people like Richard Arnold and yeah and Matt Judge but again they are from exactly the same background as Ed they're accountants they've even come through the same route Price Waterhouse Coopers blah 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 into the financial sector uh, they all went to Bristol University around about the same time this is a small team of people who are, 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 are you know I don't don't come from this this football background and and I think United need a, a wider um Brains trust, as it were. Maybe you know, keep these guys as part of it, but they need they need more knowledge on board. They need something different. So that that that's that's personally what I think should should happen at the club. I don't think there's a need to, to hound Ed Woodward out, but I think there's a need for him to just hand on the reins. You know, show maybe show a bit of humbleness and just hand on the reins to to, to people who can really focus on it and probably have got experience of building football clubs that he hasn't got. Well, I think, I think you're right there. And I mean, if you look at everything that's gone on with City in their decade since they were taken over and the, the progress that Liverpool made in the last few years, I don't think United can now ignore it anymore. I think change does have to happen at a club level. What that change is, we don't know. But thank you very much for joining me today, Jonathan, in terms of discussing Ed Woodward, you know, his rise through. Hopefully this has offered you a bit more insight into exactly what's gone on behind the scenes and maybe why restructuring is absolutely essential at United if we are to hopefully get back to where we were before Fergie retired.